Welcome to Brother Miller's Notes. I'm so glad you're with me today as we study some of the most popular and awesome stories of the entire Old Testament. These stories are found in 1 Kings chapter 17 through 19. Some of the things we're we'll going to be talking about today is limping between two opinions. We're going to discuss one of the most faith-filled lives, the widow of Zarephath. She is an amazing example to us. We're also going to talk about how to better recognize and act on the Spirit. Before we do that, let me just give you a little bit of background. In the first part of 1 Kings, you have a united Israel under the reign of Solomon. This united Israel barely outlives Solomon. After Solomon's death, there is going to be a split in Israel. So there is going to be a northern tribe, or the kingdom of Israel, under leadership of Jeroboam. That's about ten tribes. The kingdom of Judah is under the leadership of Rehoboam, or this is the southern kingdom. In 1 Kings 12, it kind of gives that background. Here's why they split. Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel come, that's the northern part, and spake unto Rehoboam, who's been made king, saying, here's the gripe. Your father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore make thou grievous service of thy father, and his heavy yoke which he put upon us lighter, and will serve thee. You've been taxing us. It's been tough. King Rehoboam, verse 6, consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon's father while he yet lived and said, how do, how do you advise that I answer this people? So first, this is kind of smart. These great advisors are experienced. Great. Verse 7, And they spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day, and wilt serve them, and answer them, speak good words to them. Then they will be thy servants forever. Very simple. Just be their servant. He does not like that advice. So, verse 10, And the young men that were grown up with him spake unto him, because he asked them their advice next, saying, Thus shalt thou, shalt thou speak unto this people. Thus spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our hoke heavy, made it lighter to us, but thou shalt say unto them, kind of, I'll try to do that sarcastically, hope you'll appreciate that. My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. I'm going to rule with strength. And now, whereas my father laid you with heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father chastened you with whips. Hmm, yeah. I will chasten you with scorpions. I'm going to add to what you have. I'm going to be a despot. <laughs> I'm going to be, well, it doesn't go over well. And there's a split. So, this is 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 1, 4 through 8. They split Jeroboam to the north, Rehoboam to the south. To the south. But spiritually, both kingdoms struggle. They struggle with the same thing, idol worship. Now, the northern kingdom, the problem is, after they split, where do you go to worship? Well, Jerusalem's in the southern kingdom. The Temple of Solomon's in the southern kingdom. And the fear is, if the people go to the southern kingdom from the north, it may influence them. They may start to say, eh, I kind of like it here. I like that I can worship in the southern kingdom. So, verse 27, that's the concern. And verse 28, the solution? Well, we got that story. Two golden calves keep pop popping up. Let's make up two calves of gold. And here's your new gods. And he put one in Bethel, Beth, house of El, God. So it should be a good thing is now becoming a polluted house of idols. And the other put he in Dan. That's the northernmost, more, northernmost part. And this, verse 30, became a sin. For the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. And he made a house of high places, made priests of the lowest of the people, which are not of the sons of Levi. Jeroboam didn't just simply lose his faith in Jehovah, but willfully created these golden calf idols and false priests to compete with true religion and the temple worship that's at Jerusalem. He did it for his own political purposes. He made the priests to be, you know, devilish causing the true priests and the tribes of Israel to flee to Jerusalem. That's in 2 Chronicles, about chapter 11, where it talks about that. Well, you also get for the southern kingdom uh, and northern kingdom, what happens? You get all in the chapter summary of, of 14, 1 Kings 14. Jeroboam's house is going to become ruined. 
his child's going to die, and Israelites, Israelites are going to be scattered because of their idolatry. Well, Judah, under Rehoboam, southern tribe, also turns to wickedness, and it's not going to go well for them, all because they're worshiping idols. That's the background for the prophet Elijah. That's the life that he lives in. You'll probably notice from this uh, little bookmark that we maybe all have had, or maybe not all of us, but it's been around for a long time. Elijah is in the northern kingdom. His job is to take an idolatrous people and turn them back to God. Now, here's a little bit of the genealogy. If you want to take a little screenshot of it, great. But on the right-hand side, you see, as we talk about Rehoboam, and left-hand side is Jeroboam. And we're going to talk first, we go a few generations, to Omri. He has the distinction of being more evil in the eyes of God than any of the other leaders before him. Quite a great distinction. And verse 26, he did not, he did not walk in the ways of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and his sin whereth he made Israel to sin, to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger with their van vanities. Now, not to be outdone, his son has this said about him. And in the thirty and eighth year of Asa, the king of Judah, began Ahab, the son of Omri, to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria twenty and two years. Nice long reign. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of, of the Lord above all that were before him. Kind of reminds you of the book of Ether. They just keep getting more and more wicked. And verse 31, it came to pass, as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ebal, king of the Zidians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. Now, Jezebel, this is from the Bible Dictionary, is a Phoenician princess, the daughter of Ethbal, the king of the Zidonites, the wife of Ahab, king of Israel. This marriage, more than any other single event, caused the downfall of the northern kingdom as Jezebel introduced in Israel the worst forms of Phoenician worship in place of the worship of Jehovah. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 20, the name is applied figuratively to a woman or a sect causing great harm to the church in Thyatira. That's the Bible dictionary. This woman does more to destroy Israel, this marriage, than anything else. And now under the scene, Elijah. Elijah means my God is Jehovah, or Yahu is God. He's a Tishbite, which means literally captivity. The site where he's kind of grows up is not known, but there is kind of a traditional site. Joseph Fielding Smith talked about the power that Elijah had, and that he had not just the Aaronic priesthood, but the Melchizedek priesthood. President Joseph Fielding Smith explained. All the ordinances which would be performed by the Aaronic priesthood remained with Israel in the dark days of her disobedience. It was necessary, under these conditions, that there was someone with authority to perform ordinances, such as confirmation. For we know that the prophets of the Old Testament had the gift of the Holy Ghost. We read in 1 Kings chapter 17 that power had been given to Elijah to close the heavens, that there would be no rain except by his word. He had power given him to bless the widow's oil and meal to bring down fire from heaven to consume his offerings and destroy the false doctrines and priests of Baal. The fact that Elijah had this great power and authority did not prevent other prophets all from also holding some divine authority in the Melchizedek priesthood, which was essential to the faithful in the house of Israel. We should also remember the fact that in the days of our Savior's ministry, this authority held by Elijah was bestowed by Elijah, and the authority held by Moses was restored to Pe Mos by Moses to Peter, James, and John. So Elijah is one of the inhabitants, and he goes up to this wicked Ahab and says, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, here's this binding covenant. It's not just as I live, but as God lives. And we know he lives. Before whom I stand, there shall not be any dew nor rain in these years, but according to my word. Well, now you get these other fair characters. This is Jezebel and Ahab. Well, the Lord tells him, get thee hence, turn eastward, hide thyself by the book Cherith, that is before Jordan. And 
It shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook. I have commanded the ravens to come feed thee. The ravens are there, and they're coming morning and night. Most scholars believe that where he went to was the Wadi Kelt. That's just east of Jerusalem in the Judean wilderness. He is then commanded, after that water starts to dry up, to go to Phoenicia. Now, so you'd say in your mind, no longer Israel, but Gentile land, to a town along the shore, Zarephath. I don't know if I pronounced that right, but there's a certain widow that's going to be there. And God's among the Gentiles, inspiring her to have faith to sustain thee. This is one of the greatest women for me in the Old Testament. Because as he comes in, and you probably know the story, he finds her gathering sticks in verse 10 and says to her, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she's going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And as she's going to fetch it, fetch it, she says, turns to him, verse 12, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruse. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son. Two sticks isn't going to make a very big fire, because I don't have a lot of meal. It's only going to take two small sticks. That's all the fire I need to make the one cake. We're going to eat it, and our plan is to die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and thy son. And I just think, is this selfish? Elder Lynn, G. Lynn Robbins said this, quote, Now doesn't that sound selfish? Asking not just for the first piece, but possibly the only piece? Didn't our parents teach us to let other people go first, and especially for a gentleman to let a lady go first, let alone a starving widow? Her choice, does she eat, or does she sacrifice her last meal and hasten death? Perhaps she'll sacrifice her own food, but could she sacrifice the food meant for her starving son? Elijah understood the doctrine that blessings come after the trial of our faith. He wasn't being selfish. As a Lord's servant, Elijah was there to give, not to take. One reason the Lord illustrates doctrines with most extreme circumstances is to eliminate excuses. If the Lord expects even the poorest widow to pay her might, where does that leave all the others who find that it is not convenient or easy to sacrifice? And maybe as, you know, if I'm teaching this in a classroom or in the home, we read the rest of, of this story and find how the Lord blesses this widow and her son, and a prophet that they have meal and oil to last them through the rest of this, this uh, famine. Maybe here's a few thought, few thought questions. How's the choice this woman faced similar to the choices the Lord and his prophets have asked us to make? Why do you think it's important for us to first demonstrate faith before we receive the Lord's promised blessings? And my third thought question, what if you or someone you know acted in faith and experienced the Lord's blessing as a result? That could be a great discussion of how we've had to first act on faith. And then the blessings come. And maybe the one quick story from my life. Growing up, there's eight kids. Dad was a teacher, didn't have a lot of money. I remember dad was the stake president at the time. And back then when we built buildings, church buildings, a large portion of it seemed to come from the members of the stake in which the new building would be built. And so we had a building drive. We were doing uh, fundraisers and bishops were asked to go and, hey, we want to ask so much money of you, in addition to what you're paying with fast offerings and tithings. Well, Dad, I remember him having us with a little family council, and he said, 
it's time for us. We're going to be the first one to do this. Because before I can ask anyone else, I need to ask of our family. And I remember the quick discussion of, we don't have much. So what my plan is, says Dad, is I'm going to sell the Jeep. Now you got to understand, we had an, a Ford station wagon, a yellow Ford station wagon with fake wood trim. We had a Ford Pinto, yellow, and a Jeep. I was 13. I did not have dreams of, of driving the Ford LTD station wagon, yellow with trim, or the Ford Pinto. And if you've ever seen the Ford Pinto, if you haven't, it's like the second most ugly car ever been produced. Sorry if you're a Ford engineer and you're listening to this. The yellow Jeep. Jeeps are manly, at least for me. We put the Jeep up for sale and sold it, and the entire cost that we received, money we received for that Jeep, Dad gave for a building fund. We learn through the faith of our parents. Sometimes God asks us to demonstrate our faith. And then we receive the blessings. We had many blessings as a family after that. And the rest of the story, maybe this is a little bit too long. Yes, I drove the Ford LTD. Yes, my main car as a teenager was a yellow Pinto. Because we got a second Pinto, it was blue. And my older brother got the blue one because it was blue and I got the yellow. Thought I'd just tell you that, but still, we were blessed. And maybe that was one of the blessings, is that I got to drive the, the yellow Pinto. Now, moving on. She went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the curse of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. Now, this chapter has four miracles mentioned, which Elijah performs first. He brings the famine, by, the word, by his word, he commands there's no more rain. Second, he's fed by those ravens. Third, he causes the widow's food supply to miraculously continue through the entire famine. And now towards the end of the famine, her son gets sick. And she, not really complaining, she cries to him, I've got a prophet here, and my son's dying. In essence, she said, I thought sheltering a prophet would have bring blessings and protection. Instead, tragedy has struck my home. Yeah, sometimes we have faith in the, in the Lord and we follow a prophet, and tragedy does strike. But the fourth miracle is he raises this widow's son from the dead. Now, going back to Elijah's confrontation with Ahab and Jezebel. By the way, if you're looking at this picture, I love the expression on Jezebel's face. She does not look happy. King Ahab has promoted the worship of Baal and has done more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Jezebel's not going to quite be outdone. When Elijah's gone, she's been the responsible, responsible for killing the prophets of the Lord. Elijah thinks he's going to be all alone, that she's been killing everybody else. Now, there are a few that are saved. But, now we're skipping to verse 17 of, of chapter 18, came to pass when Ahab sees Elijah, look at who he blames all this on. Art thou he that troubleth Israel? This is all your fault, Elijah. You're the one that sealed the heavens. You're the reason why we're having all this drought, this famine. It's because of you, not because of me and my wickedness or my example or what I've been doing. I love Elijah. And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Just so you know, Baal or Baal, depending on how you're pronouncing it, is a god that was worshipped in many ancient Middle Eastern uh, communities, especially among the Canaanites. Apparently they considered him a fertility deity, and one of the most important gods in the pantheon. His consort was Ashtoreth, who also is going to play a part in this story. She's the one that has groves. In essence, they do fertility rites, kind of. There's a part where their worship is about sex. So verse 19, therefore, let's have a contest. 
Send and gather to me all the Israel to Mount Carmel, all your prophets of Baal, 450. The prophets of the groves. Now, some people would say that's mistranslated. That's instead of the groves, it really should be the, the, the prophets that are part of the followers of the goddess Ashtoreth. Uh, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table, because that's Jezebel's kind of consort. That's what she's associating with. And then chapter 18, verse 21, And Elijah came to the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, Not a word. That word halt can be translated a little bit different. That word halt, it can be translated limp. How long limp ye between two opinions? Literally, the phrase, phrase means, quote, how long hop ye about on two bros? It's a metaphor taken from birds hopping about from one branch to another, not knowing where to settle. Perhaps the idea of limping through lameness should not be overlooked. They were halt. They could not walk uprightly. They dreaded Jehovah. Therefore, they could not totally abandon him. They feared the king and the queen. Therefore, they must embrace the religion of the state. Their conscience forbade them to do the former, their fear of man persuaded them to do the latter. But in neither were they heartily engaged. I just love that, that imagery. You're going from one opinion to the other. You're hopping. You're limping. So here is the great contest of the Old Testament. It's going to happen on Mount Carmel. And that's a picture of Mount Carmel. There's a confrontation between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. The priests of Baal were so unscrupulous that they rigged their altars with fires beneath them. Now, Baal is supposed to be the, the god that has power over fire. And if you could put it, do you put an altar there, and underneath it, they'd dig like a little pit. And in it, there's like a little place where there's some hot coals, and there's a tunnel there where they could funnel some air in, and a certain command, they could rig it where a mechanism is pulled, tinder would go down on that hot, branches. There's going to be an airflow going through. It's going to ignite it. And so at their command, seemingly, fire is going to come up and consume. It's a deception. So back to the quote. I'll just read Sardal all over again. The priests of Baal were so unscrupulous that they rigged their altars with fires beneath them to make sacrifices appear to ignite spontaneously. One ancient writer said that he had seen under the altars of the heathens holes dug in the earth with funnels proceeding from them and communicating with openings on the top of the altars, in the form of the priest concealed fire, which, communicating through the funnels with the holes, set fire to the wood and consumed the sacrifice. And thus the simple people were led to believe that the sacrifice was consumed by a miraculous fire. So Elijah's like, okay, let's have a contest. Your God's the God of fire. Make an altar there, but you can't have fire underneath it. This time it's got to be for real. We're going to watch you set the altar up. They set the altar up. They put a sacrifice thereon. And they took the bullock which is given them. They dressed it. They called the name of Baal from morning till noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there is no voice, nor any answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. You can kind of picture them doing all this. And now Elijah's sarcastic. He's mocking them. And I love that he lets them go first. I'm going to give you every opportunity in the world to go first. You, you have your chance to prove it first. And they're just going on at an afternoon. Elijah mocks him. Verse 27, came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, cry aloud. He's God. Ah, maybe he's talking with somebody. You know, maybe he's just out wandering. He's on a journey. Hey, you know, maybe he's sleeping. You got to wake him up. Shout a little louder. Cut a little deeper. This ought to be good. Verse 28, they cried aloud, cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. The idea is we're sacrificing a little bit of ourselves. Well, that doesn't work. And now it's about evening. It's going to be about time of the evening sacrifice. He builds an altar with 12 stones. And as he's doing it, the people are just watching. They know what he means. Twelve tribes of Israel. Twelve symbolic of priesthood, power, and authority. He put the wood in order on it. He cut the bullock in pieces. 
and laid him on the wood. And now to make sure this is not a deception, because they've been deceiving for a long time, he said, fill four barrels with water, pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Make sure it's wet. And they do it. And it's wet. Okay, do it a second time. They did it. Okay, third time. They did it a third time. Water is so abundant. It's all around the altar. There's a trench around it. It's filled with water. And I love that he just says, there's no fake in this. There's no fire underneath. This is the real deal. And he says a very simple prayer. And at the end of the prayer, you probably know the story. Fire comes down from heaven. Not from underneath like there, but down from heaven. Consumes the sacrifice. Consumes the altar. And licks up all the water that's all around. So verse 36. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, when sacrifices were held, to the true God. Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, that thou hast turned their hearts back again. Then fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burden of sacrifice, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And I just pause here because we've been talking about a lot of stories. What lessons can we learn from Elijah? Here's just a few. There's a difference between belief and faith. The prophets of Baal have a belief. They believe in their traditions. They believe in a false god. Elijah has faith in God. Faith is a principle of action. Faith is a principle of power. And there's a difference. You can have a belief in something false. You may act on that, but it never has power sufficient enough to help you and save you. Faith has to be in Jesus Christ. And the limping between two opinions. You can't limp between faith in, in Christ and belief in the world. Hey, I'm going to do this with Christ, and oh, with social media, I want to be a little bit more popular. I'm going to do this. You can believe in the things of the world. Faith in Christ is fact. You know, the numbers, there's 400 priests versus one. If God's on your side, it doesn't matter how many's on their side. God's always more powerful. You know, maybe another lesson from Elijah is his, his faith. He simply acts on his faith in God. His prayer is simple, sincere, powerful. Here's a not note. God's prophets might not be popular, might be oppressed, but God will always vindicate his prophets. And I love after this, this contest, well, maybe the next part I probably should insert, people don't love this, but Elijah takes care of these 400 prophets. There's no longer going to be um, this false belief spreading around. He takes them down by the brook and he kills them. And a side note, you know, for our modern society, that may be seem very strict. Elijah's doing what the Lord wants him, to, wants him to do. And in the Old Testament, that's kind of, uh, in society, the way they did it. Uh, Ahab is now in a chariot. I love what Elijah does. He turns to him now, because there has been three years without water, no rain. He's on Mount Carmel. 270 days of the year on average, there is dew on Mark Car Carmel, thick enough that you can feel it. It rains a lot on Mount Carmel, like three times more than it does where I live in Lehigh. And as he's about ready to go, he looks over and says, I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. And Ahab's in a chariot. He tells Ahab, you better get going. You've got to go for Mount Carmel, and if you watch Little Circle, you got to go to all the world Jezreel, because if you don't, the rain is going to get, be so bad, it's going to make you bog you down. He won't get there. And then Ahab, as he's in the chariot, he gets going. And Elijah, quote, girds up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel and gets there first. That guy's awesome. <laughs> I love that phrase. The sound of an abundance of rain. 
Elijah's faith helps him to hear that the rain was coming long before his servant goes and looks once, twice, three, four, five, six, seven times and sees the cloud forming in the sky. Faith enables us to hear the abundance of God's assurance in our lives, his abundance of joy and peace that comes from having faith in him. Faith in Christ helps us to hear the voice of God more clearly. Well, Elijah is taken to Mount Horeb. If you look, you'll see a picture of a cave that is attributed to the cave of Elijah on Mount Horeb. And he came thither into a cave. In 1 Kings 19, he lodged there. And behold, the Lord, 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 word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? Elijah has a little bit of a pity party here. He feels alone, like I'm the only one. I'm the only righteous person. I, even I only am left. And he repeats it again. I, even I only am left. And they seek my life. This is after you just blessed and had called fire down from heaven. And they still seek my life to take it away. I love that the God asks a second time, What doest thou here, Elijah? Elijah may be feeling sorry for himself, but the Lord wants to teach Elijah something. And the Lord passed by. And a great and a strong wind rent the mountains break it to pieces and the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, a fire. The Lord was not in the fire. Come on. Strong winds get your attention. You fear it. Elijah's been fearing. Fearing for his life. Feeling her alone. An earthquake. Let's get your attention with the earthquake. That'll get your attention. And then a fire. Maybe there's some cleansing kind of remembrances in there. Fire comes and cleanses us, warms us, and it can be a great thing or a destructive thing. Those are three things in Elijah's world that would definitely get his attention. But the Lord's not in anything of those three. After the fire came a still, small voice. Maybe the Lord just wants Elijah to be reminded. You may be afraid of, you know, whatever it is. Being killed would be very much afraid. But the Spirit speaks peace. What does the Spirit feel like to you? You know, and Maybe just think, what scriptures could you use to help someone better understand the Spirit and how they can feel it? Maybe other quotes or experiences. This seems to be a prophetic priority that current for members of the first presidency in Corinth 12 want us to better re know able to recognize and act on the Spirit. Many years ago, Boyd K. Packer said, and I just love this quote, that sweet, quiet voice of inspiration comes more as a feeling than as a sound. Pure intelligence can be spoken into the mind. The Holy Ghost communicates with our spirits through the mind more than through the physical senses. This guidance comes as thoughts, as feelings, through promptings and impressions. This process is not reserved for the prophets alone. The gift of the Holy Ghost operates equally with men, women, and even little children. It is within the most wondrous gift and power that spiritual remedy to any problem can be found. You can know the things that need, you need to know. Pray that you'll learn to receive that inspiration and remain worthy to receive it. Keep that channel, your mind, clean and free from the clutter of the world. And maybe as a pause, instead of having a lot of quotes on how to feel and better recognize and feel the Spirit and act on it. Maybe just some thought questions. If you're teaching a class, what prevents us from hearing the still, small voice of the Spirit? When have you felt the still, small voice of the Spirit speak to you? How is that experience a blessing to you? Is there a place, temple, church, home, seminary, where you feel the Spirit? And maybe that's one of my teaching thoughts. You can have family members or members of your class teach each other how to better recognize and act on the Spirit. Maybe you invite them. Find a quote from a modern apostle, first presidency member. If you want to do it, hashtag hear him. There are videos, there are quotes from members of the first presidency in Cormac 12. Here's how we better 
hear the voice of the Lord. Here's how we recognize. You can have an opportunity to have them get a quote. Maybe from their personal experience. Here's how I could better recognize and act on the Spirit. A great small group activity where they can teach it in a variety of ways and maybe better than what I could do. Another teaching thought while I'm at it is just emphasizing that faith of the widow of Zarephath. We can have faith like her to act on messages from prophets and we can experience the Lord's blessings as we do that. And limping between two opinions is awkward. It's spiritually painful. If Jesus be the Christ, act on it. Follow him. And today, as we've covered, I don't know what's covered, but we've talked about experiences in 1 Kings 17 to 19. Maybe it's the word experience we should focus on. Maybe we can find an opportunity to have an experience with the Spirit, to have an experience with our faith. Maybe we can have an experience in having that faith in Christ and teach that to someone else. So that's my fourth one. Today, find an opportunity to teach someone what you learned about the Spirit, about faith and following Christ. Or maybe today what you've experienced with all three. Thanks so much for spending a little bit of time with me as we've studied 1 Kings chapter 17 through 19. Have a great day. Keep smiling.